So now we come to some of the big questions that the short story raises, okay? I'm not going to go over all the plot details, I'm assuming, like with the purloined letter, that you read it and that you're familiar with it. Let's hone in, for the sake of uh, brevity, on these thematic issues. We raised the first one here, the failure of Lockean epistemology. Is that what this story is partly about? Um, after all, what is it that Roderick's doing? Well, Madeline goes into a catatonic fit, or cataleptic state, as he says, where she shuts herself off from all external stimuli. Doesn't he know that she's been doing this? This is symptomatic of this illness she's had for a long time. For heaven's sake, what is he doing with this? Um, it, it, are these two extremes on this Lockean sort of scale, uh, where he is the uber-Lockean and she is the anti-Lockean. By the way, this would be an interesting thing to look at in terms of human psychology. The house has a crack down the down the center of it. These two are, are maybe even, maybe what we're supposed to deduce from this is that these two twins are two halves of a single psyche. You know, people talk about twins as being um, kind of eerily, psychically connected in some way. Maybe that's what he's getting at here. Maybe he's trying to say that uh, that yes, we've got Roderick and we've got Madeline, but it's what Roderick and Madeline represent with respect to human psychology. Remember, this is pre-Freud, so we don't have this id and ego and superego stuff. We don't have all of that. Um, but he certainly is sticking a toe into the waters of psychology. Very interesting stuff. He's thinking some pretty deep stuff here. I don't exactly know what he's getting at. That's what makes it such an intriguing story. But... He's getting at some fairly big things, I think. He also is getting into this question of what is art and what is the nature of creativity or ingenuity. Let us suppose for a moment that what's going on here is that he is taking his sort of alter ego, Madeline, who's, you know, again, if you, if you abbreviate, the first part of her name is Mad, and he's burying her. He's burying her alive. Take a look at the books that he has in his library. The books are about spiritual mysticism, these kinds of things. His his uh, his uh, book, especially the one about Sweet by Swedenborg, Heaven and Hell. Swedenborg's a very famous mystic, Scandinavian mystic, who claimed to have been taken to both heaven and hell by God to um, to witness what it was like there, and then he came back and wrote about it. Probably a pretty crazy guy, but at the same time. Roderick's whole library is all just obsessed with what's it like to be dead. He's a Lockean guy. Everything about him deals with the natural world and his senses. But the great quest of his life seems to be, what would it be like to die and come back? What is it like to die? It's the thing I've never experienced before and that you can't experience with your senses and live to tell about it, right? Hence the painting, this long continuous downward corridor that looks like a tomb, only it's a white tomb. White, remember that. Uh, very important. Ambiguity. What's, what's beyond the grave? Don't know. In putting Madeline into the tomb, alive, we find out, is he sending a substitute on his behalf? Okay, we're getting weird, I know, but is he sending a surrogate? Is that what he's doing? And what are we to make of our narrator here? He's a kind of a passive guy, kind of goofy. At first we seem to like him. He's kind of a nice fellow, but uh, helpful and whatnot. But as the story goes on, you know, all he has to do is read a story, and the stuff in the story starts happening. Remember that? The, um, uh, um, uh, the, the, the details from the story he's reading seem to be being played out um, in the sounds and in the sights that are going on while he's reading, and he's about half out of his mind. Roderick is the one who's constantly telling him things. At some point, he even says, I had begun to be infected, uses the word infected, by Roderick's way of thinking, that madness is, in a kind of a weird way, contagious. You say, that's crazy, madness isn't contagious. Oh yeah? Well, maybe what, what Poe is getting at here is the kind of stuff that we now know is contagious about madness among charismatic leaders, cults, right? Um, David Koresh, Jim Jones, these kinds of guys, clearly mad, their followers seemed to be rational when they began to follow them, and yet after a while, once they subject themselves to the influence and the words, the teachings of these people, uh, 
bit of a contagion seems to take place, and they too lose their rational ability to make sense of what it is they're seeing, and so on and so forth. In the final analysis, let's ask this. Let's focus in on uh, on the uh, on the last scene or two there. Of course, they begin to hear things and and all of this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, at one point, uh, the narrator tells us the mockery of a, when they're putting Madeline into the tomb. He says the mockery of a faint blush upon the bosom and the face, and that suspiciously lingering smile upon the lip, which is so terrible in death. Um, narrator, how stupid are you? I mean. Did you not sort of want to check her pulse, check her breathing, any of that stuff? He just seems to believe Roderick. Roderick just says, yeah, she's dead, sorry, can you help me bury her downstairs? And he just follows willingly because he's so easily persuaded by Roderick. Again, is one of the points of the story about how easily we can be misled by others, how the madness of one person can infect uh, the rest of us in very negative and terrible ways. That's an interesting question, because if the story's about that, it's a really great story way ahead of its time. When we think about the history of the 20th century, for example, and how many crazy leaders misled people, uh, that is a really profound theme. Um, but shouldn't the narrator have said, a faint blush? On her, on her bosom, uh, hello, wouldn't that make you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, let's make doubly sure. But the narrator never bothers. The narrator never bothers. You hear cracking and ripping sounds in the Sir Lancelot story and thuds and thumps and breathing and all kinds of stuff. Now, at the end of the story, you know how it ends. I wonder how many of you were maybe clever enough to question, hmm, did it really end that way? Are we, how can, we, can we trust what the narrator says here? Because I'm not so sure. Look at what happens just before Madeline enters the room. And I'm also going to invite you to think uh, that Poe is having fun with us a little bit on another level, and that is that there's some dark humor going on here. You say, humor? Well, none of this is funny. In a way, it kind of is funny in a, in a sick way. Um, at the end, uh, when Roderick confesses that he kind of already knew that she was really alive when he put her in there, here's what he says. Not hear it? Yes, I hear it, and have heard it. Long, 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 many minutes, many hours, many days have I heard it, and yet I dared not. Oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not. I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Notice the use of the plural pronoun there, right? We have done so. Said I not that my senses were acute? I now tell you that I heard her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin. Why didn't he do something then, for heaven's sake? You're right, he has super hearing. Why wouldn't he do something? I heard tonight, Ethelred, ha-ha, the breaking of the hermit's door, and the death cry of the dragon, and the clangor of the shield, say, rather, the, the rendering of the coffin, and the grating of the iron hinges, and her struggles within the coppered archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? So the question is, if he did that, why'd he do it? Right? Again, is he sending a substitute for himself into the grave? Is she not hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footsteps on the stairs? Do I not ex distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? Madman! Here he sprung violently, violently to his feet and shrieked out his syllables as if, it were, as if in an effort, uh, in the effort he were giving up his soul. Madman! I tell you she, that she now stands without the door. Notice that, he, that, that Roderick calls the narrator a madman, calls him a madman, says we. All of this may just be power of suggestion. He's building it up and building it up and building it up, and then suddenly, look at what is said. Does Madeline actually come through the door? For a moment, she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold. Right? That, wait, I'm, let me back up for a moment. It was the work of the rushing gusts, but then, without these doors, there did stand the lofty and enshrouded figure of the Lady Madeline of Usher. Now, wait a minute. Is it Madeline, or is it her figure? Right? Now, I don't mean to quibble and mince words, but that is a distinct use of the term there, the figure of Madeline Usher. There was blood upon her white robes, again, red and white, um, and the evidence of some bitter struggle upon every portion of her emaciated frame. From a, for a moment she remained trembling and reeling to and fro upon the threshold, then, with a low moaning cry, fell heavily inward upon the person of her brother, and in, that, and in her horrible and now final death agonies bore him to the floor a corpse and a victim to the terrors he had dreaded. Okay? Now, I said there was some dark humor in here. 
she makes her way all the way out of the coffin, all the way out of the tomb, all the way upstairs, all the way through the door, and then right at the end, after having struggled to get all the way up there and out, she says, Ugh, and dies. Eh, okay, it's sick humor, I know, but at the same time, it is kind of funny. Um, also, how are we to read this line? She fell inwardly upon the person of her brother, and in her horrible and now final death agonies, bore him to the floor a corpse. Did she bear him, he being now a corpse, to the floor, or did she, as a corpse, bear him to the floor? Interesting. The two, again, are now physically united in the same sort of collapse together, which then, of course, brings about the collapse of the building. Is she really there? Is she really resurrected? Or does Roderick prop her up? We don't know. To what extent is all of this being imagined by the narrator, who has essentially been spooked into believing all of this and being told a big story? Don't know. The other thing, though, some final things to think about that are really freaky. Okay, it's a bit out there, but so is the story. Is Poe presenting two halves of a single personality? Is there something hidden in the names here? Usher seems to be a combination of us and her. I haven't seen any critic at all come up with this. I mean, it seems pretty obvious to me that there are two pronouns here, us, her. Roderick's initials seem to be asking a question, or at least part of a question, are you? Are you, us, her? Don't know. Um, Madeline is obviously also a sort of twisted resurrection of the subconscious, maybe? She is resurrected. She resurrects herself. As much as he would like to suppress that aspect of his personality, the intuitive, the feminine, the uh, creative, the whatever she happens to represent, you go with it, okay? How much, however much he wants to bury that aspect and be only that rational, sort of Lockean man of reason, he can't do it. He can't continue to suppress it. Ma magnificent, fascinating story in which there are so many different kinds of things to explore. It really is a marvelous piece.